Alfriston and Wilmington, Chapter Six of Field Paths and Green Lanes by Louis J. Jennings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alfriston and Wilmington. Echoes of War. The Nightingale. Happy England. The South Downs. Alfriston and the Star Inn. Another Restoration. An Ancient Vicarage. Content in a Cottage. Wanted a Minister. The Lone Man of Wilmington. The Priory and Church. An Old Grave and a New Tenant. A line from the Short and Simple Annals of the Poor. The South Downs beyond Wilmington. Where to find cowslips? Rumours of war had reached this quiet corner of the South Downs when I was there on the last day of April. I was watching a nightingale, the first of the year, which had just flown across the road and was perched on a hedge within a few yards of me. Presently it began to pour forth its wondrous song, and although it did not finish it, perhaps because it fancied it was a little too early in the season, yet the fragment with which it was pleased to favour its two listeners, namely a poor hedge-cutter and myself, fairly put to shame the thrushes and blackbirds which had been trying hard to sing each other down. While I was still waiting in the hope of hearing the rest, the hedge-cutter said, Excuse me asking you, sir, but can you tell me whether there is war? There is between turkey and russia but are we in it not yet ah sir they will never come here england is safe and if they did come i reckon they would soon be glad to get away again we are too much for them all that was how the great eastern question presented itself to his mind confidence is an excellent thing especially when it is not pushed too far i see you a listening to the nightingale said the hedge cutter it be a good bird for singing like i heard one for the first time three days ago as you go up the road maybe you'll hear two or three with or without nightingales one might well be glad at any time to walk a few miles on such a road as this i had started from berwick station and turned my face straight towards the south downs that beautiful ridge of hills which to the eye of gilbert white seemed a majestic chain of mountains and which in good earnest appear much higher than they really are when you are upon them so vast is the sweep of the view they afford over land and sea beneath these noble hills there are still villages to be found which are almost as they were three or four hundred years ago and towards one of them i was bending my steps to Alfriston the Alariston of Doomsday Book, a parish in which there are more British and Roman barrows to be seen today than new houses. At every stage of the road there are abundant signs that you are travelling in an old country. The farmhouses and barns have never known the hand of the modern builder. And when, about two and a half miles from the station, you come to the village and see the ancient uphill street with the long sloping roofs of the houses, and the remains of the market cross which may have stood there five hundred years or more it is difficult to realize that one is living in commercial england in the midst of a driving and pushing age about half way up the street there is an inn which will gladden the heart of any man who takes an interest in the traces which are still allowed to exist of the old times in england this inn is called the star and it must have been standing here at least three hundred and fifty years with no great change inside or out at each side of the door and along the front of the house there are carved figures one of st julian the friend of travellers another of a priest a st george waging a gallant fight with the dragon two animals supporting a staff and other figures or devices which are more delightful to look upon than all the pictures in the royal academy put together 
at one corner of the house there is a rude figure of a lion leaning against the wall but this is only the figurehead of a vessel which was wrecked on the coast some time last century all the rest is old from the roof which is half sunken in with age to the bow windows with their small panes of glass and the narrow doorway guarded by st julian and as some suppose st giles alfriston is believed to have been formerly a much larger place than it now is and mr lower thinks that the star inn was a house of call for pilgrims and the clergy who were wending their way to the tomb of st richard and the episcopal see so the house had a somewhat religious character and ornaments were adopted which appear at first sight rather incongruous with the objects of a roadside inn however this may be the figures are well worthy the notice of the modern pilgrim who will find few such ancient hostelries as this left in merry england although he will come in the way of plenty of abominable gin palaces and flaring bar-rooms while seated in the little parlour of the star at an enormous distance as it seemed from the world of the present day railroads telegraphs newspapers being all like some dim recollection of a disturbed dream i noticed a circular upon the wall with an engraving of the old church above it in this i read with great sinking of the heart that progress to a most alarming extent had been made with the work of restoring the church that wooden seats had been put in cut from the old large timbers of the south transept interior roof a new east window made and the chancel windows repaired this was sad news and when after diligent search i found the old woman who had the keys and we entered the church my worst anticipations were confirmed three parts of the edifice had been made to look spick and span new the other part remains in its old state simply because the funds have been exhausted the famous east window is new it all looks like a lecture hall just finished would it not have answered every good purpose to have mended the roof so as to keep out the wet and repair rather than restore the other parts of the building we like the old church best sir said the woman who was wheezing away dismally this don't seem to us as if it were the same church like see yonder is the old house where they say the vicars used to live i would come and show you but my chest gives out gives out a true americanism if there ever was one the old house at least was uninjured a simple timbered cottage or as one may read an ancient vicarage of post and panel a specimen of the lowly abodes with which our pre-reformation clergy often contented themselves as i stood looking at this house and thinking that old as it was i would rather have it than many a new one i had seen an old woman came to the door and i wished her good morning presently she asked me if i would please to step in and sit down it was a low ceilinged room that parlour of hers with an immense fireplace in it in which she had got her armchair and footstool and other little comforts we ha no minister here now said she after we had talked a bit and of course we miss un a good deal i wish we had e'er a one to come and sit and read a little to a body three have died here the last few years how do you manage to kill them off so fast i asked oh said the old lady very seriously it ain't us as kills em off they are worn out when they do come that's the reason of it sir the last one as was here was a nice old gentleman but his breath was bad and so he could not get about much we want a young man if so be as we could get one and i should not care how poor he was the church warden told me she went on this very morning that he was going to write to the lord chancery or something and try to get us a minister and i hope he will for it is bad to be without one a gentleman comes over from eastbourne but i can't understand what he do say perhaps it is because i am old how old are you 
i am seventy-seven sir and live here all alone oh yes i have only two children myself but how many they have i really do not know i have the rheumatism very bad all down my side no sir it is not this old house as gives it to me and i could not bear to leave it now i have lived in it a many years i want for nothing sir for god is good to me and so this is the house where the minister used to live in old times yes sir i have heard say that the popes of rome did used to live here what on earth could have put that notion in the old lady's head it fairly took my breath away i do wish sir she continued that we could get a minister here but no one seems to want to come the place be too poor i suppose oh no sir i am not afraid to live here alone god is good to me sir and i am very thankful she repeated these words very earnestly no doubt there are some who would have gone into that room and looked round and seen very little for anybody to be thankful for but it is not always those who have all the good things of this life who are the most grateful for what they get i am very glad you are comfortable said i as i turned to go away from what i can see in this world those who believe as you do seldom come to much harm they do not sir for if you trust in god he never deserts you sir no never the landscape was rather blurred to my eyes when i left that little room no doubt some profound philosopher who has discovered all the secrets of the universe could explain to this poor old woman that she was the victim of an exploded delusion and that in fact there is no god but matter and therefore nothing for any human being to trust in he might also propose to her several infallible tests prayer tests and the like by which she could ascertain for herself that matter was the be-all and the end-all but what if she took the test of her own daily experience and life and found that conclusive no doubt the philosopher would have to give her up as beyond the reach of reason one of those besotted lower classes for whom nothing can be done through the meadow at the side of the church and across the little bridge over the river cookmere a river about as wide as a lady's ribbon there is a footpath to wilmington under the very shadow of the downs or the visitor may turn to the downs at once and mount to furl's beacon and make his way over the top to lewis a distance of nine miles or so or he may go over the hills in the opposite direction to eastbourne but i went towards wilmington after a glance over the training stables which are at Alfriston, across that ancient street known as milton street where there are two or three of the oldest and quaintest cottages and barns in all sussex a stranger does not often find his way into this solitary yet beautiful region wandering on over the path which looks like a thread amid a vast field of young green wheat one's eye is caught by a colossal figure of a man on the side of the downs close by the father of giants with each hand closing on a huge staff a strange wild figure upwards of two hundred and forty feet in length how came it there it is thought that the monks of wilmington cut it in the chalk in the days when a priory existed here a priory which was founded in the reign of william rufus but the country folk hold that the fairies made it for the fairies are still believed to have their homes in these downs and many a large ring or hag track may be seen in lonely spots and strange figures cut out on the grass i have often stood before them wondering how they were made and who made them no one knows but certain it is that anybody who rambles about these lovely downs will see many strange things and hear strange sounds a wonderful old place is wilmington or winnelton as it was called before the normans came over here in the days when it was held by the great earl godwin king harold's father a village with part of its old priory gate still standing 
and a farmhouse made out of the monk's former home and a church so old that one gives up trying to find out the exact date of it it is primitive enough in construction for some of the windows and doors are cut out of the chalk on the west wall outside i saw a grotesque figure with its knees doubled up nearly to its chin carved in stone and inside there was a finely carved pulpit with a beautiful canopy over it and chalk walls and arches and ancient seats altogether one of the plainest oldest and least improved churches in england in the churchyard there is an enormous yew tree of great height for a yew as well as girth a tree said to be at least a thousand years old its companions are the dead and how many must have come to it since first it struck its roots in this soil as i walked into the churchyard from the fields i saw a white head appearing every now and then from an open grave and heard the dull thud of earth falling as it was thrown up by the spade it was the sexton digging a grave just beyond him was that solemn yew now about to be joined by still another companion and the venerable church and the solitary ruins and the weird figure on the hillside seeming to be watching all aid aid scarcely any name but this old sussex one of aid on the gravestones a large family and death has reaped them nearly all i wandered over to the open grave all was silent in this ancient and lonely churchyard save the beating of the mattock and the dull fall of the earth the sexton like all else around was old his hair was white and he had a white beard he worked very slowly and as he worked he threw human bones into the hill which was fast rising outside the grave it did not seem a real scene in any way i should not hope to persuade anybody that all was as i saw it there that day yet there was the old man in the grave and those were bones the bones of some man or woman which he was throwing up in every spadeful of earth there was a thigh bone and the smaller bones of the leg and many more and the earth near them had a tinge of brown like iron rust it was all very strange the words of hamlet rose up unbidden to the mind did these bones cost no more the breeding but to play at loggerts with them mine ache to think on't these are human bones said i to the old man yes sir and many a year they must have lain here for you see there is no sign of a coffin that must have rotted away long ago do you know whose grave it was oh no it is too long ago for that we ha not used this part of the churchyard much a very old grave sir and bad working in it he struck hard into it with a cruel-looking three-pronged tool and then began again with his spade and threw up more bones i tried to turn a little earth over them with my stick but they refused to be covered and so no one knows who was buried here why no sir how should they it was long ago for the ground is so dry that it must have taken a long time for a body to get like this the grave is very old some poor person i suppose no doubt sir but it makes no difference now this is what we must all come to sir and we don't know how soon the grave told the tale it needed no sermon from within it i have not much time to spare said the sexton for the funeral be at half past four it was then near three i shall not get home before milking time and who is to be buried here oh sir it be a poor woman as lived over yonder and very sad it be about them she had three children at a birth a month or so ago and she was very destitute her husband works on the line now although he was formerly a labourer the children all died 
and the poor mother lingered on till last friday shocking destitute as i believe sir poor thing she was fairly wore out very sorry i be for em all for the other five children as they have got are all young and the father is dazed like it be a great trouble for him and the mother is to be buried in an hour's time yes sir and she is better here perhaps but i be sorry for him and the children they live over there he pointed into the beautiful country beyond more beautiful than usual it seemed as i turned from that mournful earth and the ghastly relics of some fellow creature who had once walked over these fields as lightly as the best now tossed into the sunlight as if in grim irony of existence to look out from the churchyard upon the endless landscape startles the mind that all seems so serene and immutable while we tis but a day we have before us to wander through these fast vanishing scenes a brief day well nigh over before we realize that it has begun and the end of it is a heedless labourer digging a hole in the ground and a few solemn pathetic words said over deaf ears and a vacant place left in perhaps one or two faithful hearts and a hillock covered with grass an end but too familiar to us all yet never familiar who can but think of that noble passage of carlyle loftiest of all modern teachers this little lifeboat of an earth with its noisy crew of a mankind and all their troubled history will one day have vanished faded like a cloud speck from the azure of the all what then is man what then is man he endures but for an hour and is crushed before the moth yet in the being and in the working of a faithful man is there already as all faith from the beginning gives assurance a something that pertains not to this wild death element of time that triumphs over time and is and will be when time shall be no more past the old church and the ruins of the priory there is a narrow cart track which leads straight to a chalk pit and close to that pit the long man stretches himself far up the hill i walked up to the spot and found that the outline was bricked in a work of recent times in horsefields sussex it is stated that the indentation is so very slight as not to be visible on the spot although it may occasionally be seen at the distance of two or three miles it is to be seen quite plainly now the bricks being clear of grass and laid too deep some people in the neighbourhood have taken this precaution to prevent the disappearance of their local giant there appears to be a large tumulus in the hill just below it from the long man a broad path runs round the brow of the hill and half england seems to be at your feet the downs at this height present as fine a field for walking as any one could desire but it is evident that few do desire it for a boy who was frightening crows from a newly sown field told me he had not seen a stranger there for three weeks he seemed to be having an uneasy time of it two or three large crows would alight at a far corner of the field which was on the hillside and as soon as he made pretence to go towards them some old stagers descended upon the ground from the other side and this game they kept up as long as i watched the scene it did not seem to be a pleasant way of passing the day the downs were in many places literally covered with the cowslip the freckled cowslip as shakespeare calls it the bed of the most lifelike of all fairies ariel in a cowslip's bell i lie there i couch when owls do cry on this particular day there were miles of cowslips lighting up the green hills i kept along the downs till i found myself nearly opposite polegate with its junction and then struck down towards it and soon reached the station thinking much of the yew tree and its silent companions and of yonder lonely grave 
and the sad group of children left motherless in a hard world end of alfriston and wilmington chapter six of field paths and green lanes by louis j jennings 